A black businessman finishes a day at the office and then goes out for uh, supper with some friends and when he's done with supper he's driving home in his shiny new car and feeling pretty good about that car and then he sees the lights start flashing behind him and a policeman is there and pulls him over and asks to see his license and uh, shines light in his eyes and looks at him real closely and and after a while, um, just lets him go. And it turns out that the man was pulled over for driving a nice car while being black. The police officer simply gets suspicious when that's going on. He jumps to a conclusion. A person I know wrote a paper while at college, um, had taken a lot of courses in science and biology and is in business as well, and at the end had to write kind of a major paper at the end of the program, and um, wrote a very fine paper with a lot of um, technical information, but then also expressed how his faith in God and in Jesus Christ was going to impact his future career and influence uh, his care for um, the creation and things like that. And the judges of this paper came back and gave him excellent marks on that paper, but this was a secular university and one of the judges observed, well, that stuff about God could have been written in the 1800s. Now, once again, the person just kind of jumps to a conclusion, is, is kind of surprised that somebody so smart and so well-informed would still take God seriously as the one who's directing uh, his future career. Jumping to conclusions is something that happens a lot. And it happens uh, in relation to people, but it also happens in relation to the person of Jesus Christ. People reach their beliefs and ideas and how they are going to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ um, by jumping to conclusions based on some pretty flimsy stuff. I want to ask today with you the question, how do you know? In a sense, we're going to think about thinking. How do you know what you know? And I want to um, look at some parts of John chapter 7. In many ways, John 7 is an anatomy of how not to make up your mind. Um, I'll just give a few examples from John chapter 7. One is publicity. Um, what seems to be the reigning consensus among those who determine what news is news? Another way of making up your mind is, well, what are the people I know saying? Well, you know, what's going on on Facebook? What are my buds talking about? You know, what's the buzz? Uh, and you can reach conclusions just based on the words of people around you. Another way is, well, what institution did they graduate from? And what degrees do they hold? And are they worth listening to? Another is, well, what are my assumptions? And if anything they say or do goes against my assumptions, it's obviously um, the case that they're wrong. Uh, we all know that my assumptions are all correct. And then there's just flat out prejudice. Oh, came from the wrong town, came from the wrong region. The wrong kind of people are impressed with him. The right kind of people all look down their nose at him. I guess that pretty well settles it. And we see each of these in John chapter 7. First, um, Jesus' own brothers say to him, you ought to leave here, you know, up here in Podunk, Galilee, and go down to Judea so your disciples may see the miracles you do. And no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. They're giving him this little speech about, you know, if you really were somebody, you'd understand PR a little better, public relations. Um, you'd get a good ad agency, or at least you'd show up in the right places to get noticed by the big shots. And still today, it's sometimes easier to believe in somebody just based on the publicity they've been getting or on their celebrity status than somebody you just happen to know. These... Guys grew up with Jesus, and evidently a certain degree of familiarity bred contempt. You know, it would be kind of bothersome to grow up with a kid who actually was perfect, who actually was right all the time, 
Um, but I guarantee you, if you grew up with a kid who was right all the time, you wouldn't think he was right all the time. You'd still be just as sure that you had been the one who was right a good deal of the time. At any rate, this, this notion of, of just knowing somebody, uh, rather than having their huge, important profile splashed all across the news, we know that people in the news are somehow more credible and believable than just somebody you happen to know. I, I know um, sometimes when my kids were doing driver's ed and they would ride with me on um, trips to where I was preaching, they were somehow much more impressed if I was preaching in a big fancy church with gobs of people in the pews than being the guy who preaches here in, you know, in the glorified machine shed. You know, that because you, you're more important if you're if you have a bigger crowd, or they'd say, oh, you mean you talked with this famous person today or this famous Christian singer? Oh, I, yeah, I guess so. Um, well, that person's not all that different than anybody else you happen to know. So in some cases, they might be better. In some cases, they might be worse. They may happen to be more famous. Um, you know, so be it. I, I suppose in Nigeria, the only reason people would have heard some of those Christian singers was because I put them on my program. <laughs> so, you know, for some people, I was the celebrity. Uh, so yeah, celebrity really is not a very good basis for deciding whether somebody is worth believing in. And if that's just true of ordinary folks, you know, it's supremely true of Jesus. Even his own brothers didn't believe him. They thought he needed to go make some news. And then there's just the ordinary people. You know, nowadays, ordinary people can talk to each other more than ever. It's not just your friends, but you live nonstop. I mean, I, I was over at Joliet Junior College this week, and three-fourths of the kids walking down the hall don't even look at you anymore. They're walking, down, they're walking down the hallway like this, and you just don't want to get run over because they're all looking at all their little smartphones in between classes. But, they're, but they, a lot of why kids are on their phones or on other stuff is that they, you have more access to hearsay, just what people People are texting each other or what they're looking at on Facebook or all the other stuff. Uh, muttering. Okay, it's not, I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just saying there's always a buzz. There's always whispering and muttering going on. There was much muttering about Jesus among the people. While some said he's a good man, others said, now nah, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. So some people just hold back on what they really think. But there's a lot of, a lot of talk going on here and there. And you'll find that... Too. I mean, on a good many of the sites and uh, people's pages, you'll find even talk uh, about God. And a lot of it goes this way, a lot of it goes that way. If you were going to make up your mind based on that, you'd just get dizzy. The crowds are saying, well, he's a good man. Others say, no, he's leading people astray. And nobody is quite sure. And a lot of them aren't even saying what they're really thinking. And then Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? That's kind of a perennial favorite. This, you know, who is this guy? Uh, he talks like he knows what he's talking about, but, uh, you know, come on. We know he didn't go to our schools, and he didn't study with the people who really are in the know, so why would you listen to him at all? Well, Jesus answered them, my teaching is not my own. Jesus did have a pretty decent teacher, um, seeing as how he himself was the son of God and how he had, was taught by the father himself. He says, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Jesus says, the real problem here is not that I didn't graduate from the right school. The real problem is that your will is out of tune with God's will, and you don't want to do what God wants, and therefore, you really can't afford to find out whether I'm for real or whether my authority is not from God. But still today, uh, a good, I mean, if you're going to run for president these days, you better have graduated from Harvard or Yale. I think Reagan graduated from Eureka College. But other than that, um, it is very, very important um, nowadays to graduate from one, from one of a handful of the elite universities, or you will have a very hard time getting a second look. 
from those who are in power. And much the same holds true in the realm of academia. Credentials matter enormously. The degrees you have and the institutions you have graduated from. Now, it's not necessarily bad to have a lot of degrees, but it doesn't really prove a whole lot one way or the other whether you're worth listening to when it comes to the things of God. And it certainly was not the case for Jesus Christ. Jesus did not have the advanced degrees. He simply had direct insight from God the Father. Then come the assumptions, the, the things that you know that you know, and there's no arguing about them, and you evaluate everything else in terms of them. We know that nobody does anything on the Sabbath. And if they do, it's bad. And so we spotted a guy carrying his mat on the Sabbath. That guy is bad. And we said to him, Guy, why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? And he said, Well, you know, I was crippled all these years, and some guy said, Get up and carry your mat. So, well, I got up and carried my mat. Shame, shame, double shame. And who told you to carry your mat? Well, you know, you've got some pretty strong assumptions if, if somebody can say to another person, get up and carry your mat after they've been paralyzed for years, and they get up and carry the mat. You might want to ask now, how in the world did anybody have the power to heal somebody instantly? But instead you're saying, what a naughty person for mentioning the carrying of a mat on the Sabbath. And Jesus says now... Um, you know, you guys actually do a little bit of work on the Sabbath. When it's the eighth day for a baby that it's been born and you need to do a circumcision, you do that because um, you know you're, that the law of circumcision takes precedence over that do nothing on the Sabbath law. And so why are you so ticked at me for healing a, the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. I'm going to return to that sentence later on because it's kind of the core of everything that I'm driving at today. Stop making up your mind on misleading things and learn to make up your mind with a right judgment. Another kind of assumption that we see in John chapter 7, the people know where Jesus comes from. They say, we know where this man is from. When the Christ, the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. Their assumption was that when the Messiah came, his origins would be unknown to anybody. And since they knew that Jesus um, had grown up in Galilee, they knew that he couldn't be the Messiah. Pretty obvious. Others had a little different idea about the Messiah. They weren't among the nobody knows where he's from school on Messiahs. They assumed that Messiah would come from Bethlehem. And since Jesus comes from Nazareth, well, case closed. How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Obvious. And we know that this guy grew up in Nazareth, so it's pretty simple. He's out as a candidate for Messiah. You have your assumptions, and you make up your mind based on those assumptions, never considering the possibility that there might be a few more facts that I never considered. Uh, one fact, Isaiah chapter 9 says, God will honor Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government there will be no end, and so forth. And this is all going to happen in Galilee of the Gentiles. So Galilee might not have been in such a bad position, you know, in light of prophecy after all. The real challenge was how do you get Galilee and Bethlehem and nobody knows where it's from together in the same package. Because um, it's not that they were all wrong about their ideas about the Messiah. It's just that they were missing some things and didn't know how to put them all together properly. And of course, there was a person who nobody knew the real place that he came from and he was born in Bethlehem, and he did come from Galilee. Uh, but when you have your assumptions, and this can happen in a lot of different ways in relation to God and in relation to Jesus, we're often too proud to realize that we don't have the whole picture. And because we don't see how it can all fit together, it can't fit together. We maybe ought to consider that God is greater than that small space between our ears. And so that's another way of jumping to conclusions or, or just 
um, making up your own mind prematurely. And then there's this very blatant one, just prejudice. Has any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? You know, if he was anybody, a Pharisee or a ruler would obviously believe in him. When it's only the dumb crowd and the lowlifes that take somebody seriously, you can kind of write them off. Because anybody who's important will be recognized by the important people. No, this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Yeah, they believe, some of them at least believe in him. Well, there is one Pharisee who said, well, you know, guys, I, I, I'm a Pharisee. Uh, and he'd been to Jesus earlier. He says, uh, does our law, you know, us real smart, good law-abiding Pharisees, does our law condemn somebody without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? Hey, you from Galilee too? Look into it. You'll find a prophet doesn't come from Galilee. Boy, it's nice to know the intellectuals look into things and scrutinize them so carefully. But in this case, they don't. They, they know who they despise. They know what kind of people, the social class of the mob. And if, even if some of that mob believe in Jesus, we people who know. And if there are some people who actually are kind of in the know, who've checked him out like Nicodemus had, and Nicodemus had heard, you must be born again, and God so loved the world. And he, that was really still working in his heart. By the time Jesus died, Nicodemus went and um, identified himself publicly with Christ and took the body down from the cross. We don't know what stage of his development he was at here, but he was definitely at the thinking stage, not at the jumping to conclusions stage. And he said, boy, you really ought to check this guy out before you make up your mind about him. And they said, Pah. It's just so much easier to dismiss. And so, um, in John 7, you see again and again and again these ways of dismissing, of just going by publicity or um, hearsay or academics or assumptions or prejudice. Even today, you'd find, I, I've seen it, where people will say, yeah, I know that Christianity is not dead. I know that a bunch of people in China and a bunch of people in Africa, you know, there's a pile of them becoming Christians, but hey, educated people in Europe and North America. And after all, we know they're the truly smart and informed folks who are really with it. A lot of them have decided Christianity isn't worth considering. So the Galileans and the Chinese, they can have that Jesus stuff, but, you know, we, we know better. And, and you'll see that. And so what I want to talk about is just digging in a little deeper about how we know what we know in the first place and how we make up our minds. Jesus said, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And that, that's a two-sided thing. Don't judge by appearances, and that means you need to avoid misleading ways of deciding what's true and right. There can be some bad ways of reaching your conclusion, so you want to avoid those and not judge by mere appearances and how things look to you at first glance. And then judge with right judgment. Embrace sound methods for deciding what's true and right. So you want to be able to get at the truth, and you also want to be able to get away from uh, methods that are more likely to lead you to jump to conclusions on the wrong basis. Uh, the big word for this is epistemology. I really try not to trouble you with words like this too often. Um, my degree was in philosophy. I, two of the foremost epistemologists in the world um, were my teachers, so I, I'll, I'll inflict this on you for a moment. Um, Alvin Planning and Nicholas Walterstorff um, are actually, you know, if you want to do the, the whole um, institutions thing, I'm actually planning it did go to Harvard, and Walterstorff did teach at Yale, and yada, yada, yada. But, the, the point is they knew a lot about epistemology, but epistemology really isn't that, it's a big word, but it just means your theory of knowledge or how you know what you know. And philosophers, they, they think about that quite a bit, and they study epistemology as an academic discipline. But even if you're not a philosopher or a philosophy major or anything like that, um, you still have an epistemology. You might not label it that. You might even not think about it or recognize it. But you have an epistemology, uh, a basis for either accepting things or rejecting them. How do you know? On what basis do you make up your mind? Those are epistemological questions. What are your grounds for believing something? What are your grounds for denying it? What are your grounds for saying, well, I'm just not sure. I, I don't know one way or the other. 
That's what epistemology is about. And one of the big names in epistemology would be René Descartes. Now, some of you may recognize that name for other reasons. He was a great pioneer in analytic geometry. He invented the Cartesian coordinate system. And some of you are already muttering, I hate this guy. <laughs> um, he provided the basis for infinitesimal calculus. He is hated by math students everywhere who don't like math. And so, yeah, so already maybe I've turned you against epistemology. A guy named René who um, invented this mean stuff. But hey, Rene is just a French name, it's okay. And um, math isn't all bad. I was a math major once upon a time, before I turned to philosophy, which was also Descartes' other <laughs> occupation. So anyway, but Descartes made a few mistakes. Um, Descartes wanted certainty. And so he was concerned with this whole question of how do you know what you know? And being a great mathematician, he thought, you know, in math, things are clear. They're certain. They are proven. And an awful lot of other stuff is just kind of up in the air and, and quaking. What we need is to be able to know stuff with the same clarity and certainty that we know math stuff. All real knowledge really ought to be like mathematics. He didn't quite put it in those words, but that's basically what his procedure was. He wanted to reject anything that you can doubt at all. So you start by doubting everything. And you want to find some axioms or some ideas that just can't be doubted. They're just beyond doubt. And you take those as your foundation, and then you use airtight logic to build all of your beliefs on top of that foundation of stuff that can't possibly be doubted. That's how math proceeds. It has these axioms, and then it uses proofs and moves along. And so Descartes thought, wouldn't it be fabulous if we could just get all of our knowledge to be like that math? And it can't be doubted. So he doubted everything. He decided to doubt the existence of God. He decided to doubt the existence of a universe and of persons outside himself. He decided to doubt his own existence and see where he could get by doubting everything in the whole universe. And finally, he found his bedrock axiom. I am thinking. That means I exist. Cogito ergo sum. I'm here, I exist because I think and now I have proved that I exist based on the fact that I am thinking. A fundamental flaw in the great man's logic because the premise has the word I in it. And so you cannot have a valid argument where the conclusion I is already buried in the premise. His own existence is in the premise the moment he said I. He would not be able to get his proof past the, let's say, the Buddhist doctrine of no self. Buddhists would say clusters of things happen, but there is no ongoing I. And so the proof doesn't work. Um, but anyway, I'll leave that alone. Um, he thought he had proved his own existence. And I'm one of those nutcases that thinks you don't have to prove your own existence. You can just know it. Um, and there's a few other things you can know without having to prove it to yourself. But... The big question really is he, he started this project of trying, and, and by the way, he was a Christian. And after proving his own existence, he proved God's existence. He proved the existence of the external world. He proved a lot of other things. Um, but again, proofs are only as good as um, what you're willing to assume in the first place. So basically his approach was we're going to start with total doubt, doubt everything, and then see if we can find a way to build total certainty based on stuff that's beyond doubt. I can't doubt that I exist. I can't doubt the laws of logic. And so I'm going to prove everything based on my own thinking and existence. Um, I don't think it worked very well. But there has, Descartes' project has been pursued ever since. People thinking that mathematical approaches are the ones that give the greatest certainty. And that doubt, doubting everything, is the path to knowledge. And along with that comes a distinction in our own age of making facts, things that are very different from values. Science and math, those are objective truth. Values, uh, religion and morality, that's subjective opinion. Uh, so, and we've learned, um, and we, growing up in the society we're in, that's the approach that's taken. That's why you'll often find that in public life, science, so-called, reigns even in politics 
And religion has to stay out of it because we know that science is factual and that religion is private opinion. Now, in that kind of setting, again, asking how do we know what we know, ask this question. Are science and math more objective or certain than biblical theology and morality say? Um, what postmodernists have done is to take the same skepticism that was once applied to religion and morality and say math and science are no more certain than any of those other things because the, the methods of them, they involve symbols, they involve uncertainty, they involve metaphors. Um, C.S. Lewis, just a couple little quotes. Math is a metaphor, physics is a parable. When he deserted metaphor for mathematics, he did not really pa pass away from what's uh, just a symbol to the symbolized, but just from one set of symbols to another. He said math is, is a symbolic, metaphorical construction, a way of thinking about the universe. When you get to physics, and they talk, just for example, whether light is a particle or a wave. Well, it's neither or both or something. Uh, we're not quite sure. Um, is matter really matter? Is it really stuff? If you get into the highest levels of physics, they just can't put it into words. And so Lewis says, without a parable, modern physics speaks not to the multitudes. You know, he's just, lamb he's taking off on this statement about Jesus that he didn't speak to the multitudes without a parable. He says, the physicists, those guys are using, I mean, dark matter. And, you know, the, they say 90% of the universe is stuff that's unobservable just to make the math formulas work. Again, I'm not lampooning it. I'm just saying they're as much into very mysterious sayings. And sometimes they don't illustrate but merely suggest like the sayings of the mystics. He said the modern physicists are as mysterious as the strangest saying of a Zen Buddhist. Uh, that how do you describe actually what physical reality is? The physicists uh, are in a very deep and hard to understand state of things. And so the point is that has caused a big headache for people at the highest levels of intellect and maybe some of you say, I don't even want to go there. Well, that's fine. But the fact is that We've been sold a bill of goods that mathematics is absolutely certain and the best way of thinking about reality. And I was a math major. I don't hate math. But math is not the only way to think about reality. And not all knowledge needs to be constructed like mathematics. And mathematics itself has been proven by the greatest mathematicians that it is impossible to construct a mathematical system that is comprehensive, that covers everything, and at the same time is self-consistent. That's Kurt Gödel. He's a German mathematician. He proved that. And so the mathematicians themselves have huge headaches, and there's always the big question Einstein asked, why is it that the ideas of mathematics would have any correspondence to the world outside us at all? The, the answer Christian gives is, of course, well, the God who created the universe with certain patterns helped us to discern something, at least, of those patterns in the way that we think about things and number them and arrange them in our own minds. Those who don't have that premise have a very hard time explaining why would you trust anything about math at all. Well, um, just cutting to the chase. Can any thinking be trusted? That's, you started out wanting absolute certainty and Descartes' project of being super scientific, super mathematical. We're going to doubt everything. Well, Darwin came up with a theory of how things came to be, which it would essentially posit that the human brain is a randomly evolved blob of meat with random firings of electrical impulses. That would be the basic statement of what a human brain is to an atheistic evolutionist. Or, as Darwin put it a little more um, colorfully, with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? In, in one stroke, if you have said the human brain is a randomly evolved thing, you have zero reason to take any theory arising out of that brain seriously. And the foremost American philosopher of postmodernism, Richard Rorty, understood that. He said, the idea that one species of organism, that is humans, is unlike all the others, oriented not just toward its own increased prosperity, but towards truth, is as undarwinian 
as the idea that every human being has a built-in moral compass, a conscience. So he's simply saying, if you are a good Darwinist, you do not believe that there is such a thing as a conscience which is supposed to discern right and wrong. And it is undarwinian to think there is such a thing as a mind that is oriented towards grasping of truth. Now, you at that point have a choice. You can go along with Rorty and try to remain a, a consistent Darwinian and say, I do not believe that conscience is ever on to anything. And I do not believe that mind is an accurate reflection of reality. Or you can say, I think there's something wrong with that theory. I, you know, I think that thinking means something. And I think that conscience means something. So, uh, again, how do, how do you make up your mind? Again, let's get back to this notion that the way to certainty is to doubt everything. Nowadays, that's almost turned into the notion that it's smarter to be skeptical. Agnostic is a word sometimes used in relation to God, um, that, you know, you're leaving the question open. You're not saying, well, I know there's not a God, or I know there is a God. Um, it's just a word that's coined from Greek, and it means without knowledge. Um, there's a Latin word that's similar. That Latin word is ignoramus. Now, the one has a very different connotation than the other, doesn't it? Uh, one is kind of a respectable, knowledgeable word. The other one is, what a dunce. And so... And, and the way that one even says, I'm agnostic, might um, reflect one way or the other. If you say, I'm agnostic, are you humbly admitting that you're an ignoramus? Some people might. I mean, there are some kind of humble agnostics who just say, I don't know yet, but I'm, I'm looking into it. There are others who, say, who are agnostic, and they're boasting. I'm a brilliant skeptic. Uh, you don't know um, yourself, and you say, and I know that nobody else could possibly know, because they couldn't know more than I do. Uh, and you're smart enough to know that nobody can know. You're smart enough to know that being agnostic is the smartest approach to take. Now, that, that's a proud claim because not only are you saying, well, you know, I don't know about God because God hasn't shown himself to me in the manner that he has to others. Or the sacred texts that others have found very compelling just haven't hit me in the way that they've hit others. And Maybe that means there's something amiss with me and with my mental or spiritual equipment. I mean, that, that would be a, a humbler approach to agnosticism and say, I don't know because God hasn't revealed himself to me, so if he's there, I sure hope he will. That's quite a different pose than saying, huh, we smart people know that you can't know. Now, um, Dallas Willard says, we live in a culture that has for centuries now cultivated the idea that the skeptical person is always smarter than the one who believes. You can be almost as stupid as a cabbage as long as you doubt. The fashion of the age has identified mental sharpness with a pose, not with genuine intellectual method or character. Now, Descartes was brilliant. Uh, he made a wrong turn when he turned down the road of doubt as the way to certainty, but he was brilliant. A lot of the would-be brilliant doubters these days are no Descartes when it comes to intellectual firepower. Uh, but the very fact that we say, hey, nobody can know that, we, we somehow think that that makes us um, intellectually lofty. It may just mean we're as stupid as a cabbage. Now, C.S. Lewis had a good thing to say. He was preaching to a group of seminary students who had been brought up to doubt everything in the New Testament and to be very skeptical about all the sayings about Jesus and all the sayings about his miracles and, um, and to think that 20th century skeptics understood Jesus better than his first century disciples did. And he said, I don't know how these German guys who are 20th century professors are supposed to understand Jesus better than the people who lived with him and knew him and listened to him. But anyway... He finally said, I don't really want to reduce the skeptical element in your minds. You know, be, a, be super skeptical. That's great. I'm just, I'm just suggesting that your skepticism need not be reserved exclusively for the New Testament and the creeds. Try doubting something else. There are a good many other things in our world that are worth doubting that people just swallow. 
And, and yet all of the doubt is directed at the teachings about Jesus in the New Testament or the teachings of the Apostles' Creed. Just try doubting something else. Try doubting the notion that math is the model for all true knowledge. Try doubting Darwinism for a few minutes. Try doubting skepticism itself as a good method. Now, doubt is not a bad thing. And Lewis said, you know, try doubting something else. You need to be both um, a curious person, a person of wonder, a person who is open to believing stuff, and at the same time, you have to have a pretty good doubter in you. Um, you have to have a strain of skepticism in you. Both are very important in terms of coming to knowledge. A sense of wonder is a desire to discover, to know as much as possible, and you don't want to miss out on truths. A person who has as your main um, driving force a sense of wonder, uh, both in the sense of wondering what's the facts, but also a sense of wonder or amazement or a delight in the, in the truths and the realities that there are. If that's your uh, kind of dominant attitude, then you're going to discover lots of new stuff. And you want to know as much as possible, and your biggest concern would be to miss out on some really fantastic realities and some really important truths. Now, if doubt is your main thing, then your driving desire is to avoid making mistakes, to avoid being made a fool of. You want to be fooled as little as possible and not believe errors. Now, of course, nobody in the world wants to go around getting fooled all the time or believing, you know, 87 errors a minute or something. Nobody wants to do that. But here's a question. Is your biggest fear that you're going to be wrong or fooled sometimes? Or is your biggest fear that you're going to miss out on a lot of wonderful things? Because if you go through life squinty-eyed skeptic, nobody's going to fool me. And you're going to have to prove to me my own existence, or I'm not going to believe it. Well, you, you'd go through life believing zero. And you are never fooled. Or you may go through life quite open and trusting. I mean, that's how children are born. Um, uh, open to believing what they're told. And, of course, you can sucker a little child and tell them almost anything, and they'll believe it. And you're abusing uh, your opportunity if you do that. But we're created to have an openness to reality and a sense of wonder and curiosity and discovery. And then we do have to turn on that inner doubter and start sorting out the balderdash and the bad approaches to learning and the prejudices and the jumping to conclusions. And that's a lifelong project of learning to sort out the lies and the mistakes. But it's more important to be open and curious and wondering in the first place and then have doubt do its proper thing as well. Wonder and doubt are both valuable for knowing, but wonder is more basic of the two. And so, in a sense, Jesus' statement there, you've got doubt, you should not judge by mere appearances. You should doubt just a, a superficial impression. But you want to have healthy wonder, where you embrace sound methods for deciding what's true and right. Now, I want to... Think about what really shapes your beliefs. One thing that shapes your beliefs is your intellectual ability. How smart are you? You know, if, if you were not gifted with um, a very sharp intellect, then there are a lot of things you'll have a hard time knowing or figuring out. There are some people who are born with serious mental disabilities, and their capacity for forming lots of correct propositions or even for understanding certain things in the realm of language and mathematics and science might be very limited. And so that's going to affect their beliefs if they just don't have the capacities in the first place. And then those whom we might consider more in what you might call the normal range or whatever, there are still people of very great intelligence and sharp memory and computing ability and talent with logic, and that's going to affect your beliefs and what you're capable of grasping in the first place. Also, what have you experienced? You know, what are the sort of things that have happened to you? What kind of things have you run into or observed yourself? What kind of things have you studied? Sometimes a very smart person might still have major gaps in their knowledge just because um, they haven't experienced very much, they haven't traveled very widely, they haven't had much of an education or training, and so you might miss out on that. Now, 
The thing is, when we think about how do you know, when we think about how we think, it's often limited to these two things. Well, it's how hard I think about things and how much I've dug into these matters personally and discovered. That's how, how a guy like Descartes considered things. You know, I'm going to use my mighty brain and I'm going to not believe anything I've been told but figure it out for myself based on what I can discover. But there's a lot more to your beliefs than just how fast your brain works and how many things you've been exposed to and experienced. What assumptions don't you question? We've seen earlier the role of assumptions. We all have certain kinds of assumptions and different cultures have different assumptions, very different assumptions. My degree is in intercultural studies and, very, and different cultures of the world just come at things with a whole different way of looking at life and the way they explain things and they, you don't even question it. It's just part of your mental um, framework. What, and related to that, what worldview must your ideas fit into? If somebody starts out knowing that there is no supernatural and no such thing as demons, for instance, then that will never, ever be something they would use to explain a phenomenon they observed. You could have someone displaying all the biblical symptoms of a demon-possessed person, and they would say, that person is not demon-possessed. I know that there's some sort of psychosis or some sort of seizure going on here. And it might well be the case that there is a psychosis or a seizure, and that's all it is. But my point is, if you have certain assumptions, then you say it can't be any of those because your worldview doesn't allow for that possibility. What authorities do you listen to? Now, sometimes those who criticize um, faith in the Bible, for instance, or believing what a pastor says, they say, you just believe that on the basis of authority. You're not thinking for yourself. Well, that may be true. 99.99% .99 of what you know is taken on authority. How many of you, even what you know in math, thought it through from the roots up and wondered about why math would even have um, any validity in the universe in the first place or any application to realities outside of you? How many of you, even if you consider yourself a scientist, and say, well, science doesn't take anything on authority. We examine the data. Okay, but 99.99% .99 of what you know about the data was told you by somebody else or found in a book, okay? You did not do it. You all, the, maybe not all of you were in school. Those of you in my generation, when you were in school um, and you did a chemistry experiment or a biology experiment and it didn't turn out the way you expected, you generally wrote out how it was supposed to turn out anyway. <laughs> just because you knew how it was supposed to turn out, so I must have just botched it. You listened to authority, basically, instead of believing what was in front of your nose, um, because you assumed the authorities were probably were based on better experiments than the one you had just run, and you were probably right about that. Um, but the fact is, in every realm of life, we listen to authority a great deal, and it's not whether we listen to authority, it's more which ones and how do we test when they've gone off the tracks. Here's another very important one. Um, sociologists will talk about the social construction of knowledge or plausibility structures, which is basically a big fancy way of saying how you think is shaped by who you hang out with or by who you hung out with and are now reacting against. It's who you want to fit in with or who you're fighting with. I find this a lot among university students. I remember a girl that I talked to and she came to me and said, you know, I used to believe um, all that stuff about Christianity, and, and I, I, I still want to, but, you know, now that I'm in university, it's so much harder to believe. And I asked her, well, you know, what, what kind of things have you been studying, or what kind of um, information and evidence is it that is making it harder for you to believe? And she said, well, no, it's not really any information or evidence or proofs. It's just that there's so many people there who are smart who don't think the way I think. And that in itself shook her foundations. It wasn't any new info. It's just who she was in there with now. And that can have the same impact on behavior as well as on belief. Who you hang out with shapes how you think and how you behave. Not just, though, who you fit with, sometimes also who you fight with. 
That's another factor, by the way, of some kids going off to university for the first time. Part of it is a new crowd. Part of it is, okay, mom and dad, you drilled this into me for all those years. If you're going to believe A, I'm going to believe Z. Uh, my default setting is if you taught one thing, I am quite convinced the other is absolutely correct. And I have solid proof because you believe the opposite. Well, okay. Um, this is a dynamic, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying here a little bit, but it is a very common dynamic that I've seen a, a lot of times where it's who you want to fit in with or who you're fighting against that really is shaping your beliefs more than the actual consideration of the truths or, or information and data involved. Another important one, what do you want? What's your heart's desire? Jesus says, you know, if your will is to do the will of him who sent me, you're going to find out whether I'm teaching the truth. If you don't desire what God wants in the first place, uh, nothing I say is going to make all that much sense to you. What's your heart's desire? What's the, what's the opposite? Um, Friedrich Nietzsche, the man who was famous for teaching that God is dead and the great philosopher um, who launched postmodernism, said that, that if there are gods, you know, I couldn't bear not to be a god, hence there is no god. Well, that was a good argument, wasn't it? Uh, he did not want a world in which if there were somebody supreme and great, he wasn't it. Hence, there is no it. Um, and he then went, he, by the way, died insane, but uh, that's another story. The, the fact is he desired that there be no God. A modern philosopher that I've quoted before, Thomas Nagel, said, I have a cosmic authority problem. It's not just that I don't believe there's a God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. And our heart's desire drives how we think very, very much. It, it drives our attitudes about morals, too. Margaret Mead was a person who went to Samoa and studied the culture there. And she found that this was a peaceful, harmonious, delightful culture where people slept with whomever they wanted and did whatever they wished with whomever they wanted. And coming of age in Samoa was such a joyous and liberating and fun and delightful thing. And we could learn a lot from the Samoans. And we have PhD level research to prove it. Well, others who went to Samoa later found the society to be quite unlike what Margaret Mead described. It was not nearly as promiscuous as she had described. And where it was promiscuous, the damage and the broken relationships were a lot more severe than anything she had described in her research. But she provided intellectual cover for the sexual revolution of the 1960s. She herself was a promiscuous bisexual and found what she was looking for. This is how... Knowledge often works. When your heart wants something, you will find what you're looking for. It even happens in the realm of science. Now, again, to quote C.S. Lewis very briefly, he says that every age gets within certain limits the kind of science it desires. He said that before Darwin or any of the scientists came along with a theory of evolution, the poets were already speaking of the evolving of the universe and of humanity evolving into things far greater. And evolution was already in the poetic water before ever the scientific theory came along. Lewis went so far as to say if there had not been scientific evidence to support it, it would have been necessary to invent it. Now again, I'm not saying one way or the other uh, at this point whether um, any of those theories about age of the earth or ancestry have any validity to them at all. I'm simply saying that there is the climate of an age which looks for certain evidence. Again, when you have a trial and you have an attorney who's cross-examining somebody, there is the evidence and the truth, but then there's also the way you put the questions. And you're only allowed to answer the questions that are posed by the cross-examiner. And a good cross-examiner can work wonders um, and make a totally innocent person sound horribly and filthily guilty or give a very different, and without ever getting one fact wrong. 
they will ask the proper questions to bring out the items they want brought out in a certain light. And so what, what we desire to find and the manner in which we pose the questions will really shape the manner in which we think. And then, as I said before, what's your pattern of action? What are you already doing that you really don't want to stop doing? Or what do you wish you could do? And what ideas would make it more convenient if you could only believe those are true? Jesus said, if you desire the will of my Father, if you're doing the will of my Father, then you're going to find out whether what I say is true or not. And this question, what would it cost to change your mind? I've had it before, and I know a lot of other um, Christians and pastors and apologists have had it, where you could make a very strong case with somebody. You might even be able to answer the hard questions they have. But, but they keep on going. And finally, you simply ask a question. Now, if it could be demonstrated to you that Jesus is the Son of God, would you start following him? If it could be demonstrated to you um, just on the matter of morality, that your current sexual practices are sinful, would you be willing to change those practices? And often the answer is no. We're playing an intellectual game here is what it boils down to but we are not ready to actually change our mind and our very being. Now, when you look at these from the other angle, what intellectual ability or what have you experienced or studied, um, as far as strengthening Christian belief, use your powers the best you can. Um, study as much as you can. Know what some of your assumptions are and what your worldview is. Um, pay attention to some reliable authorities. Most of us are not great sages. Most of us are not great scientists. And we're going to have to find out who some reliable authorities are to listen to. And of course, um, I believe the supreme authority we have to listen to is the word of God recorded in the Bible. Choose your companions carefully. They will shape how you think. You are not just a thinking machine. You're a social being. Your thinking will be shaped by those you hang out with. Hang out with some good ones. Hang out with people, not just whose theories sound impressive, but whose lives you want to live by. I don't know anybody who will live by a postmodern notion that there is no such thing as objective truth or no such thing as objective morality. Hire them for two weeks. Hand them a paycheck for a third of what you promised them and find out if they're a postmodernist. They will say, you promised this amount. Yeah, but um, we don't believe in absolutes and amounts, you know, they kind of vary in the mind of the amount describer. And, uh, and blah, 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 blah. It, nobody can live by such a creed for five minutes. It's all a bunch of yakety yak pose. And so uh, there was Piero of Aaliyah. He was one of the ancient Greek skeptics. He would travel around, and he had a crew of his buds traveling with him because he didn't believe anything else existed but himself. So he had his buds, who did believe in his existence, traveling around with him to make sure that he didn't run into walls or walk over cliffs and things like that. That's what you need if you're going to go with that totally skeptical mentality. You, just, you get to be a moron if you have a bunch of other people look out for you. Um, but just understand that thinking is a little more complicated than I woke up one morning with this great logic machine up here, and I considered the data carefully and reached a conclusion. These are some of the things according to our own experience and according to the Bible, that shape how we think. Another thing that shapes it all is what kind of knowledge are you looking for? Because your method depends on what you're trying to know. If you want to examine a dead thing that you can measure or control or dissect, you take one kind of approach. But even that approach doesn't work for living things. To dissect a jaguar will tell you some things about a jaguar. But you might also want to observe a live one, and maybe keep your distance too. Um, you know, there's a difference between dissection of a thing and dealing with a living being. And it's even more so if you're dealing with a person. When you have a person, you need to understand what a person is thinking and feeling. And dissecting my corpse will not tell you a lot about David Fettus. It will tell you a lot maybe about my anatomy and my innards but not the real innards. The only way you're going to know the real innards and how I think about you, as well as how I think about various things, is if I tell you or show you. And so that kind of knowledge, personal knowledge, depends on the other person's revelation and on your receptivity. Those two things. Not just, God's not a frog that can be dissected, okay? 
You won't know anything of God unless he chooses to show something of himself to you. And if he has also produced in you some receptivity to himself. You need receptivity in here and revelation out there or you will not know the personal God. And the techniques that are used for knowing impersonal stuff don't work when it comes to knowing the living God. And so back to Jesus. He reveals himself through his works, through his words, through his spirit. I just want to highlight those three aspects of revelation. First, um, Jesus works. You know, with all these doubters and all these who are saying this and that about Jesus, there are some of the people who believed in him. And they said, well, when the Messiah appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? You know, that's maybe not the deepest, most profound thinking in the world, but it is saying, can you top this? There's no other explanation. He's got to be from God. He's got to be the Messiah. There's nobody going to come along that can do what Jesus has done. These miracles of raising the paralyzed and turning water into wine and walking on water and feeding thousands with a little boy's lunch. Uh, you know, no can do. He's got to be it. And then this story in John 7 also has these officers who are sent to the temple to arrest Jesus in the middle of his teaching. So they're walking in there to arrest him, but they stop for a minute or two, and that's a big mistake because all of a sudden he's got a grip on him, and he's talking, and, and there's something about him and his words, and they listen, and they listen, and they kind of look at each other and say, you want to arrest him today? Nah, me neither. And they go back to the people who sent him to make the arrest, and, and the Pharisees say, what? Where is he? Uh, you were supposed to arrest him. Why didn't you grab him? Well... Nobody ever spoke the way this man did before. Nobody ever spoke like this man. So Jesus' words, it's the same kind of thing in a different setting that happened at the, at the Sermon on the Mount. You get that great Sermon on the Mount, and then at the end it says, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he spoke as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Sometimes when I'm dealing with somebody who's skeptical, I'll just ask him, well, Okay, we can use this or that kind of argument or evidence that might make sense to you, and I'm willing to explore that with you. Would you just read the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John or, you know, any of those? Just read. Listen to a while what Jesus did, and even if you find it hard to believe he did those things, you listen to what he said. And you ask yourself if there was ever another voice in the history of the universe that talked like that, that had such wisdom, such insight into human life. Uh, I mean, some of these philosophies, if you tried to live by them, the world would be totally ruined. If people actually did live by the teaching of Jesus Christ, all would be well on this planet forever, and we all know it. And so sometimes just, just listen and see that nobody ever spoke like this man did. And then realize that God's spirit, you, it may be like the wind, you can't just confine it or nail it down or dissect it, but when God's spirit is working in you, he's real, and you know it, and you don't even need to prove it, because he's the one who's doing it. Jesus himself, when he speaks of his miracles and his works, says, don't judge by appearances, judge with right judgment. When he speaks of his words, he says, if anyone's will is to do God's will, then these words, you'll find out whether it's from God. If you really want to know God and be in tune with him, when you hear the words of Jesus, you're going to be hearing the voice of God himself. And at, late in that passage in John 7, the basic question is this, are you thirsty? If anyone thirsts, you know, what is your heart's desire? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And this he said about his spirit. How do you know? There's a lot of different aspects of epistemology. I've skated over a lot of them very, very lightly. Here's some pointers on epistemology when it comes to Jesus. Pay attention to these works. If you need a little help in the background, read a book like C.S. Lewis's Miracles just to clear away some of the clutter that gets in the way 
of hearing and believing in miracles these days, but pay attention to Jesus' works. Listen to those words and hear a voice that spoke as no one ever spoke before, and then let that thirst of your heart listen to it. Don't just say, oh, this is kind of a weird fact about me that I have a longing for something that nothing in this world will satisfy. Say, I think it's Jesus I want. I'm thirsty. Come to Jesus. Trust him and find out. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And when the streams of living water flow into you and begin to flow from you, you'll have the proof that you need. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you for his wisdom, for his truth, for his reality. And we pray that you will attune us to that reality. Help us, Lord, not to um, make a false judgment, um, to jump to premature conclusions, but instead to have uh, knowledge of you and knowledge of your world. Lord, where, where cynicism and skepticism have become too powerful in our age and in our own lives, help us, Lord, to become more trusting and more open to reality. And above all, we pray simply for the new heart and the new spirit that can recognize and receive Jesus and become one of the children of God. Lord, I pray for that blessing on all of us here today. For Jesus' sake, amen.